and welcome to Spy Hard Podcast. I'm Agent Scott. And I'm Cam the Provocateur. And we're back with another Spy Master interview. This week, we are, of course, discussing the film Bridge of Spies from 2015, directed by Steven Spielberg. But we were lucky enough to sit down with the film's screenwriter, Matt Charman. Yeah, this was really exciting. He was nominated for an Oscar for this film alongside with the Coen brothers who worked on the film as well. And I am always riveted when I hear stories about writers or talent working with Spielberg because I just want to know more about his process. Yeah, and you know, you, you you'll hear his genesis in in the industry and it's quite inspirational when you think about how he got to where he is now and and how this film got off the ground. But let's not bury the lead, Cam. Let's get right down to it. Matt Charman, roll the interview. And joining us on the show now, it is the writer of this week's film, Bridge of Spies. It is none other than Matt Charman. Matt, thank you for joining us. It's a pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. Uh, it, it's not often that we're uh, joined by such esteemed talent to be nominated as, as you were. So, and, and this film is, is a blast. So we are really excited to talk about it with you. Oh, thank you so much. It's, uh, it's fun to go back and talk about something like this as well. So thanks for the chance, you know. Um, with our interviews, when we have someone, we like to sort of chronicle their story before we necessarily get to the film itself. So our first question is how you got started in your fields. How did you get started in screenwriting? I, um, I started, I suppose, in a fairly unusual way in that I, w- I was kind of, I always wanted to write, but I didn't really know that I could. You know, my, my, my parents aren't from the business at all. You know, my dad, until he retired, sold agricultural equipment and my mum was a hairdresser. And, um, you know, I didn't really know anyone in the business. I, I studied in London and I think that really changed everything for me because I, I was just on the doorstep of the West End. You know, I was mm. able to, to sneak into lots of sort of second acts of plays because obviously being a student, you know, not being able to afford tickets, I would kind of wait for everyone to bundle out at half time and everyone would be smoking or whatever and uh, having a quick drink. And then I'd follow them in and find a, an empty seat and sit down and watch the second act of, uh, you know, probably a, a show every, maybe three or four shows a week, really. And then the next, uh, I would go after the show had finished. You know, I remember laying in bed back in my halls of residence thinking about, well, what had the first act been? You know, what, what, mm. what had I missed? What was the... What was the story? What was the bit that I, I hadn't got? And, uh, and then either go and read about it in the school library, you know, go to, to, go to the uni library and, and read it up or go to Samuel French's. And I just loved the feeling of being in the middle of a drama. I loved, I loved watching the way an audience responded to characters and dialogue and juicy situations. And so I started to kind of quietly write and, and play around with some stuff at university and some friends. But again, didn't really think it was it was something I could do, uh, to be honest. I, I just I I, uh, I left uni and and bumped around and did a load of kind of crappy jobs while I was trying to work out what I wanted to do, and then entered a, a new writing competition with with my first play, and I, I used that as a deadline. Um, the the Soho Theatre in in central London do this amazing thing called the Verity Bargate Award, and that's for you know, first time writers, people that have never written anything that want an opportunity to to show what they can do, emerging voices. And so I, I wrote and delivered that and I got shortlisted and uh, they had like 700 entries and I got this phone call saying, you know, you're on the on the shortlist. And then and then I won this thing. And it, it was an amazing opportunity because it it was a five week production in in London and it was, you know, uh, professional cast and production and everything. And that finally got through to him. It finally made me realize, okay, well, maybe I can do this. You know, maybe I'm allowed to do this. Maybe it's not for other people. Maybe it's for me, you know? So that was the start of the start of writing and the start of the journey of seeking out stories, things that I wanted to see either in the theater or on TV and film. I'd grown up um, quite remotely in the kind of countryside, you know, very happy, but not a lot of other kids around. And me and my brother used to make stuff up and, and, and mess around and make up our own stories and things. So I, I'd, I'd always been watching a lot of videos and DVDs growing up. So I think film was something I was always gravitating towards. Uh, even while I was writing theater, I was always like, what makes a great movie? What, what, what stories do I want to tell, you know? Do you remember what some of your early influences were? Because um, if you're looking at all of these films and you're working in theater 
at a certain point, you were probably thinking you could maybe transition over. Was there anyone in terms of old films that you'd said, this is kind of what I would like to do if I moved into film? Yeah, I mean, I grew, I grew up, you know, as a lot of, a lot of people my age with, with Robert Zemeckis, with Steven Spielberg, with Chris Columbus, with those kind of movies that seemed so impossibly fun and strange and otherworldly and yet about our childhood and what, what we felt, you know. So I, I'd grown up with that stuff. I also, I remember, you know, watching Sidney Lumet movies at uni and, and starting to get really excited by strange characters and different ways of telling stories and, and, and also stylistically more formal ways of telling stories, you know, how to be a bit more technical with the information that you included and didn't include. So I was kind of, I was always interested in terms of writing for screen in finding a different way of telling a story I hadn't heard before to make sure that it didn't fall out in such a conventional way, you know? So influences across the board really, but what I did know when I was starting to write was that I was drawn to true life stories. I was drawn to, to, to real things that had happened and real people in history that maybe nobody knew about, they hadn't quite been discovered yet. And so I was really always following those little kind of um, breadcrumb trails, you know, just little footnotes of things here and there, uh, which is, you know, very much how Bridge of Spies came about, you know. Well, was there any moment or something that set off that spark of realizing your interest in history and bringing that over to, you know, storytelling? I remember watching when it first came out with my brother on VHS, I remember watching JFK when I was when I was quite young actually, and just being mesmerized by that movie. The combination of like historical research, but also just pure drama. I mean, truthfully, like looking looking at it now, a lot of it is is made up, <laughs> you know, a lot <laughs> or a lot of it is certainly kind of um willed into the world by the way Oliver Stone makes movies. But I remember seeing it for the first time and thinking like, wow, this is incredible. Like this guy's broken open this whole case. Like he's completely, you know, and, and, and the fact that I got so caught up as a young person in uh, the death of a president that I never knew, I wasn't even born, you know, like I, I had no connection to this moment in history. And yet there was a filmmaker making a movie in the 90s that reconnected me with it. Uh, and made me feel stirred up and angry and um, disappointed that this kind of figure had been lost by this by this assassination. That that really started to ring alarm bells in me. Like it, there is a way to do history. There is a way to do um, politics and, and things that have happened in the past that don't need to feel uh, locked away or distant. They can feel as alive and dangerous as something that's ripped from yesterday's front page. You know. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we're charting a course towards Bridge of Spies now, but you know, you've just in this story so far, you've you've had this five week show that you've won through the competition. Mm -hmm. What did you start to work on in between getting to Bridge of Spies? What were some of the things you yeah. you, you made? Well, I mean, I, I was very um, committed to theatre. You know, I, I was lucky enough that show um, that sort of launched me got seen by. Um, people that worked at the National Theatre in London. So they offered me the opportunity to kind of come and do a bit of a, a, a residency there and spend some time developing some ideas. And so my next three plays happened at, at the National Theatre, which was an amazing experience. I mean, for anyone that's that's been, it's a very special building. For anyone that hasn't been, you know, it sits on the South Bank. It, it has, um, you know, three theatres in it. So every day it's it's doing, you know, three different shows at any one time and there's all sorts of events going on around it so once you start to have a relationship with the building you you are able to bounce from a comedy to a to a you know a period tragedy to a brand new piece of writing you know you can see so much there and so as someone who was self-taught as a writer that was my education was sitting in every different audience for every different kind of show and understanding you know what it what it was to make great drama and what, what, what to aspire to for these incredible writers that, that, that would be given this opportunity to write for the national. So that was huge for me. And it also helped me frankly work with, with actors. Cause you know, in, in writing plays, what you do is you spend a lot of time in the rehearsal room, tweaking, rewriting, trying to tailor something to 
the performers to, to listen to their instincts and what it is that they need to make a piece of drama work. And so you get pretty, pretty uh, thick skin pretty quickly because, you know, nobody is uh, standing on ceremony. And if someone says a line is bad, they'll, they'll tell you it's bad. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, but that's great because that, you know, it's good to not be precious and it's good to just keep working away at a script and honing it. And so that just, I think, got my, my kind of skill set up and that made me as a self-taught writer just get more and more confidence. And it was actually, I had a play in New York um, that uh, went on at the Armory, which is a big, big building in New York that's, that sometimes hosts kind of music, a big uh, concerts and things. And we had a, a play in there that uh, I'd written and that Josie Rourke, who used to run the Dolmar Warehouse and is now a film director, she, she loved and we did in Manchester. And then we took to New York. And while I was there, um, Disney uh, optioned the play, which was really exciting and wanted to do it as a movie. And they said, you know, um, come out to, come out to LA and uh, you know, we'll, we'll meet and we'll talk about it. And I went out there and met with them and then had a bunch of general meetings set just to say hi to people. And that was my first experience going out to LA to sort of start to talk about the movie business and to start to talk about, you know, how you could as a playwright transition into writing movies, you know, as a, and become a screenwriter and, and those general meetings for anyone who's ever done them, it's, it's, um, it's called the bottle tour or whatever, because you just, you collect water bottles from everyone who gives you a water bottle in every meeting. And you've just got a car full of fucking half drunk water bottles, but <laughs> you, you know, you, you have these wonderful meetings, but I'll be honest, I was a long way from home. I had a little, my son was very young and I felt incredibly guilty about just like going from general meeting to general meeting. So after I'd done the first couple, I went back to my hotel and was determined to use the time I had out there to try and tell a story and see if anyone would be interested in, in, in buying it off of me. So that's where Bridge of Spies started to find its feet, really. It's a story that I'd researched probably over about a two-year period. Mm. I'd found a footnote in a book, um, again, back to JFK, you know, a, a brilliant biography called uh, An Unfinished Life that Robert Dalek wrote. And there was a little footnote in the sort of Bay of Pigs section that spoke about um, this lawyer that had been involved in trying to get the, uh, the um, US servicemen that had been caught and captured in the, in the sort of failed Bay of Pigs invasion. And the footnote said, you know, James Donovan rose to prominence for the part he played in, in the spy swap between Gary Powers and Rudolph Abel. That was it. That's all the footnote said. And that really, really just grabbed me. And I was like, whoa, who is this guy? Because those are two amazing things he did. You know, negotiate with mm. Fidel Castro for those guys and get an American spy back. You know, I knew a little bit about the U2, but I didn't, didn't know any more than that. So I just started to dig. And, and with a lot of these things, you expect any moment to find, oh, they made a TV movie about that, or they made mm. a movie about that in the 60s or 70s or 80s or whatever. And the more I dug, the more I realized that not only had they not made a movie about it, but no one really knew about this guy. He was incredibly modest, sort of very special, kind of bullish, talented New York lawyer who had been pulled into this most remarkable kind of everyman story. And I just loved it. It had to me everything that I wanted a movie to be, you know, in the spy genre, which was I wanted to feel genuine danger and threat to someone that I felt I maybe sat next to on a bus or met, you know, at, at, at someone's house for dinner or just a no, an ordinary person in an extraordinary situation. So I started growing this story and uh, met James Donovan's son, John, who's a wonderful human being and, and so proud of his dad. And uh, I used the opportunity, you know, of being in New York to, to meet with him and uh, sit with him and talk about who his dad was and the experience of, everything that had happened on the family and all the time growing, growing, growing the story and growing, frankly, uh, my own understanding as well of the, the reality of the Cold War and quite how dangerous it was. You know, we study it, we read about it, but uh, you don't know really until you start to get first-hand accounts from people who genuinely thought they were going to wake up, you know, um, with no water, with no electricity, with bombs dropping all around them, you know. 
at this stage then so you you're you've spoken to the son of james donovan as well and were you looking to create a, a screenplay for a film i know you were talking yeah. to you know studios or was it a place it was a screenplay for a film it was a screenplay i knew really early on that it was a movie i just felt mm. it really instinctively because the journey from new york from a kind of comfortable lawyer's life in new york he was an insurance lawyer and the idea that an insurance lawyer would end up you know needing to cross um the berlin wall and, and and get inside enemy territory and negotiate just felt so cinematic and so kind of exciting for for an ordinary person to be thrust into that world but also truthfully you know i i knew too that it was um it was a small bullseye you know these period movies um that require the U2 being shot down, the Berlin Wall being built, all of this stuff, they're big, you know, they're, mm. they're expensive and, and not many people can get them away. So I was also aware of quite how uh, tough it was going to be. But I think there's probably a part of you that when you're first starting out, there's a naivety too, which is like, well, let's just try it. You know, like I, I didn't know any better, really, honestly. I, I, I just thought it was a, he was in a remarkable man. It was an incredible story. Rudolf Abel himself was a fascinating human being, you know, and the relationship he had with James Donovan was, was truly a friendship. So there was so much that I loved and I just kept nudging it forward. And by the time I went to LA and, and was doing these kind of general meetings and boring myself silly, listening to my voice, <laughs> um, I, I just thought, well, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna start to tell this story. I had enough research. I'd had mm. a couple of years growing it. And so I just, I started to pitch it in a really old fashioned, I've got a story for you. Can I tell you? And and the first pitch was a bit of a rambling, pretty 25 minute thing. And by the end of the first day, I pitched it five times and it was down to about 15 minutes and all of the fat had fallen off of it. And it felt very lean and mean and had a start, a middle and an end and all of the fun sequences that I wanted. And um, I remember, really remember distinctly my agent phoning me and saying, uh, at the end of that first day like what so what are you doing what you're this is you're here for general meetings like what's going on or people are telling me that you're pitching something like what <laughs> what are you doing like a little bit annoyed mm-hmm. i think because it was that wasn't why i was there and i explained you know i wanted to use the opportunity and i had this story i was really excited about and he said okay well let's have dinner and you can tell it to me so i pitched him the story that night first night over dinner and uh, he was like okay all right listen i'm going to change your meetings I, this is good. I, I feel how passionate you are about this. I really love this story. And so I started over the course of Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday to do, I think, six pitches a day to studio execs, to producers, to everybody, you know, um, and tell this story I was passionate about. And it got tighter and tighter and better and better. And, you know, uh, I think it got down to like 12 minutes and it, and it, yeah, it was a, it was an exciting week. Suddenly, you know, as a, well, a real uh, interesting way of sharpening a story. Do <laughs> you know what? Elevator pitch, elevator pitch, yeah, elevator it, pitch. It's, seriously, though, I I talk to a lot of um, you know, a, a lot of I work with a lot of emerging voices and and new writers and uh, and I, I I think the art of pitching is it, it, we often like a lot of people are a bit snobby about it. And it's like, well, that's just being a salesman or whatever, and it's actually not. It's an amazing thing to be able to tell a story in a succinct way where the story punches through we all do it you know everyone goes to the pub and says to their friend god this thing happened to me today amazing thing you know like everyone does it we're all Mm. we've all got that ability and yet we somehow feel like when it comes to pitches that we get a bit coy about them and I, i i i think go the opposite way like embrace a captive audience you know, if you've got, if you've got, if you're sitting opposite someone that wants to uh, hear a story from you, that they're, they're, you know, they're with you, they're locked in. Like you've got half an hour of their time or an hour of their time or whatever, go for it. I think there's nothing like unfolding a story in front of someone where they don't know where it's going, and they are just so excited by that. So I, I enjoyed it, and I, I, it got to the point by the end of the week where we were having offers from people, and people were were, were wanting to, you know, buy the buy the the rights to the to to the idea and for me to write it as a movie and so we had three or four offers and then on the final day i went and sat and pitched um 
someone from Steven Spielberg's company, a, a really wonderful guy called Jonathan Irick, who uh, heard it out, listened to it over breakfast and said, okay, Steven's in the office right now. I'm going to go right now. And I'm going to tell him what you just told me. And he left immediately. And about two hours later, my, um, my, my agent got a call saying, okay, Steven Spielberg wants to buy this idea. And he just wants to take it off the table. He just wants to, he, he, he loves it. He's wanted to do a spy story for a long time. He wants it. And I, as you know, I can see uh, Jaws poster on the background of, of you yeah. all there, right? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, he is, uh, there's nobody like him in my life growing up as a, as a creative force and as someone that has frankly given me more pleasure. Like there probably is no human being that's actually like, pound for pound done more for me in terms of like making me happy or making me think or making me feel a certain way than, than Steven has. So him wanting to buy that story was a huge moment for me. I flew home, just like, couldn't believe it. You know, my wife was thrilled for me and uh, got this phone call saying he wanted to hear the pitch directly from me. So I got back on the phone um, and, and pitched him and was very hot and flustered and, uh, but also, you know, like believed in my story and believed in in what this man's life could mean for an audience and, and the and the and the parallels to, you know, any moment in history, really, where it's tough to stand up and and do something that, that takes principle and courage and all that stuff. And if any filmmaker has, has shown that their work responds to those kind of individuals at Stephen and uh, he loved it. And he said, look, when can you write it? Um, yeah. So, so five weeks later, I gave them script. Yeah. So now I'm really curious because Spielberg is, as you know, as we've said, a master storyteller, what sort of notes do you get from him that help with, you know, further drafts? You get, you get the kind of notes that are frankly a dream, which is the opposite of what you might imagine Hollywood notes to be, which is grayness. You know, Stephen's really interested in he loves clarity, he loves storytelling clarity, but, but, but not at the expense of character and not at the expense of tension. So what he says to you is like, make this more complicated, make this more nuanced. Let me feel this, let me feel the difficulty of this decision or this moment or this whatever. Um, and so what you find yourself doing is frankly, just digging deeper and adding the kind of detail that makes for great movies because it gives act as more to hang on to it makes the scene much much more sort of um multi-layered and it means that a director can then work with those actors and bring more out of them so sitting with him you know after after i'd written the the first draft um he flew me out and i and i had time with him just turning the pages going through every scene looking at almost every line and saying you know how could this be stronger? How could this be better? What do we mean by this? You know, just, just stress testing everything really. And, um, and that as a, for a young screenwriter, as a masterclass was unbelievable. I mean, I can't, I can't tell you the day that those doors swept open, you know, you go to Amblin uh, and uh, you go upstairs and the doors open and he's sitting there on his couch and he gets up and he gives you a hug and it's, it's weird. It's really weird. You know, it's every, it's every dream you've had as a young screenwriter, you know? I suppose now we're in the, we're in the trenches of writing it. Yeah. You know, you've mm -hmm. had the, the go ahead from, from Stephen. He said, I yeah. love the pitch. Let's go. From concept to creation of the script, you know, you've, you've read about Donovan, you've read about Abel. How did you go about creating the on the page version, the thing you'll see on the big screen? Cause there's, there's little changes you have to make to make it a, something you can play in film. How did you go about creating those versions of them? Well, the, the, the pitch had given me a great spine, you know, it had given me a great structure to the story. So I knew, I knew what needed to happen. I knew what order it needed to happen in. And I knew how I wanted an audience to feel about what was happening. And then it becomes about dramatizing it. And it becomes about finding, you know, the humanity of each little scene of, of, a, of a man telling his family that he's going to represent a communist spy. And it's probably going to be, tough but you know like everyone deserves it deserves a, a defense and every life matters you know and and imagining what it must be like to sit down opposite a guy like Abel where you know truthfully he is a spy I mean there's it's not it's not like you're trying to pretend he's not but what you're trying to do is 
is defend the the sort of um, the system that that he has that he is sort of represents and and give some sort of justice and nobility to who this man is and and, and why he's here I guess what what he represents and so that that starts to find its way into little lines of dialogue you might write in a notebook it starts to fully form itself into scenes and but the 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 spine is the hardest thing you know and that pitch stayed with me throughout the writing process that was always there as the order of events and the way things needed to happen the first draft i wrote very fast because i think i'd done the research and it was ready to come out of me Mm -hmm. so yeah i mean you know five weeks to write that to deliver that for early jan so i wrote over christmas and that was that was fast but i also knew truthfully that stephen was weighing up three or four different movies as his next movie so i had to i had to deliver you know i had to get onto his radar and um and then the process starts of of honing it with him and of of of, of getting it ready for actors to see because you know every director needs to attract the kind of talent that's going to make us leave our houses and buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I was well aware and had always been aware that the James Donovan part was, was really, really um, a fun, unusual and yet quite classic role for an actor. Mm -hmm. And so I was really keen to shape both the Donovan part and the Abel role into a kind of two-hander that, that that the right kind of actors would would gravitate towards, you know. Now, the Abel role, I think, is really interesting because it's a character who speaks very little and is incredibly mysterious. But I remember seeing the uh, the film in theaters and you have the scene at the end where he's being put in the back of the car and your heart sinks. So I'm just really curious about writing a character like that who is so enigmatic but manages to connect with the audience in a way. And there must be something on the page, you know, it can't just be the performance because I don't think Mark Rylance signs on unless that character really speaks to him. So yeah, what's the process of writing a character like that? So that, so Abel was a fascinating character and I, I'll say this in all honesty, I think it's Mark's theater background that gave him the confidence to do what he did, which was to say to me, and I was on set in New York and Berlin was to basically to, to be the guy that was said, I don't need that. I don't need that line. You can take that away. I think we can do without that. I don't, you know, he is someone that really, really has total confidence in silence, in holding a moment, in holding a look, in, in doing as little as he needs to do to convey something. And also from an organizing principle, you know, this guy's a spy. He doesn't say anything that is going to expose him, get him into trouble do anything that might leave question marks. So the less you say, the less trouble you get into. So I think Mark was coming from the point of like how, how and enigmatic's a good word, you know, how bare bones and enigmatic can this guy be and still give us a glimpse of his soul? And for me, it, it, a lot of it came down to the tiny moments we got of understanding who he was. So he makes a, a speech which was there from the very first draft which um, is is kind of standing man speech, which I always kind of called it. And it's always beautiful when you go through a through a process of making a movie and then you get to the final thing and then you get to the score and you see a, suddenly I see a cue called standing man hmm. that Thomas Newman's written. And, and I remember distinctly um, writing down on a, on a post-it note, you know, rework standing man speech when I was like, you know, way back in my, back room trying to come up with the first draft so that speech where he talks about his father and experiences that he's had growing up it's not very long and it couldn't be very long it doesn't want to be a big grandstandy thing but you get that moment you get to know a little bit about tiny glimpse of his wife playing in an orchestra and those moments because you have been starved of information about this guy those moments become like a banquet because you just grab them and you feed on them and you, 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 as an audience, you're so receptive to them. Mm-hmm. And so I think what, what the able character to me proves it is, is how much you can do uh, when you just hold off. You just, you just say to an audience, just wait, just wait, just wait, just wait. And then you give them a little bit and then they lean in and they listen. And especially when it's a performer like Mark Rylance who, 
has an innate humanity and a warmth to him. You know, I mean, there's something about his eyes that are, there's a, there's a kindness and a sadness and a, and a world weariness, you know, and so he, he sort of invites you in even when he's not telling you much, I think. Right. Speaking of uh, Mark Rylance, but also Tom Hanks as well, that's a, that's a big old get for someone who was watching Spielberg films in, in the 70s and 80s and wanting to do this sort of thing. And obviously with your theatre background as well, when you were writing this, I guess, the, the second, second pass at it, you've taken it back to Spielberg. Yeah. Um, did you have an idea of, of casting? Were you writing with someone in mind? Or was it still just your vision of the characters at this stage? Yeah, no, by the, when I was writing the second draft, it was still, you know, Stephen had talked notionally about some different actors when we'd first spoken, but in a very, very broad way and more as a sense of inviting me to invest even more in the character. Imagine this person, imagine that person, you know, so really trying to, trying to breathe life into it for me in order to take it back and feel strong about that next draft. But I have, um, I've got this little thing. I'll hold it up to you. Obviously, it, it's a little, it's a little slip of paper. Yeah, it's like yeah. a, it's like a, a like a phone slip, mm -hmm. and it was on my agent's desk, uh, and I pinched it so I could keep it. And it says, "Message: Tom Hanks has read and is intrigued. He'll be having a chat with Spielberg. Please call back." <laughs> so that was the that I held on to that and just popped it in this little frame. That that was the first time Tom's name had come into the mix, and and and. It made absolutely all the sense in the world. And I was so excited about it because it felt like as the script had developed, he had turned into, um, you know, I, I'd, I'd often thought about those great kind of um, Atticus Fitch type characters in, in literature and in, in film history, you know, To Kill a Mockingbird and, and thought about like, what does it take to be a person of principle, to stand up, to go through enormous difficulty to follow through on what you believe in. And there is something about Tom Hanks that, that radiates um, just, I think, strength and, and a kind of a good sense and values and patriotism. And, you know, there's something through a lot of his movies, but also frankly through his personal life and through the things that he supports and the work he does that made him so right for that movie, but also, made it right that, that the movie tested him the way it did. You know, I think it, I think it does start to um, cost him how much this is hurting his family and how much this is costing him professionally and that he does find himself in a place where, you know, he might die uh, at any point trying to organise this spy swap when he's in, in Berlin. So I, I, I love that it, that it took a, a guy that felt comfortable in... New York and really uncomfortable in Berlin and that felt increasingly the more I worked on it and the more it became clear that Stephen really wanted this for Tom Hanks that it, that that he was exactly the right um sort of pair of shoulders to take this responsibility I guess I am um fascinated by the Coen brothers doing a pass on the script as well and from mm -hmm. what I've read it was a fairly positive experience for you working with them I am I would just love to know what were sort of the additions they added or what did they yeah. help flesh out because obviously they have decades of industry oh, experience right. amazing incredible. filmmakers i'm just i mean you're working with spielberg hanks the coen brothers what yeah. a fascinating hollywood film school for a newer writer <laughs> so what did the coen brothers bring that maybe helped out uh, flesh out the film i mean truthfully enormous amounts and i think probably the absurdity of of the situation you know because uh, i had i had been looking at it um I'd wanted it to be thrilling. I'd wanted it to be high stakes. And what I think uh, um, Joel and Ethan did, which is so clever and truthfully so hard to do, so hard to do is to maintain the stakes at the same time as allowing the absurdity of an American being in Berlin negotiating for the release of a pilot that the Russians won't even kind of admit that the spy that's in America is really their guy and that the guy he's negotiating with isn't talking for the Russian uh, government. And, you know, that there were so many layers of sort of lunacy to the whole proceedings of negotiating. And I was looking at it, I suppose, in, this, in a straighter way. And what Joel and Ethan did was to say, well, hang on a minute, let's lean into this craziness. Let's find the humor. Let's find the black humor in it. And I think 
what was what was fascinating to me about that collaboration was that it proved really like Stephen's earliest note of the grayness, find the texture, find the oddness. And those guys, I mean, that, that's their, their entire career, their brilliance is, is taking a scene and just turning it, just turning it 180 degrees and making you see something completely different than, than you've seen in a previous version of that scene. I mean, let's be honest, like scenes around a dinner table, scenes in a diner, scenes in an office we've seen them a million times before but when they come at them they come at them with an energy and from an angle that makes them feel wholly new and so to have them invested in sections of the movie that that did that was just like wow this is this is exactly what this movie needs at this moment you know Mm -hmm. so moving on from the coen brothers chipping in and and punching some bits up for the script i i had read that you then got it back for like a, a final sort of draft or a final polish what was your involvement at that stage yeah, so I was I was on set in in um, New York and Berlin, and I think it was about it was probably about like coming back and doing little things to bring back, make sure the stakes and the tension were never lost. Mm-hmm. I think that's probably what it was, and it was probably also truthfully about like reconnecting with the original DNA of the of the idea and of the and and Stephen had been really kind of wonderful about that and uh, because you know like there's two ways to take the news that you're gonna be you know collaborating with someone else one is like oh really like can't I just do it myself and the other is to truthfully look at that experience like you said and say well hang on a minute I'm at a table with Spielberg Hanks and the Coen brothers like that's pretty great you know and I chose I think to look at look at it as a enormous opportunity but Stephen had been really honest all the way through and said, like, you know, this isn't this isn't the end for you. Like, this is your movie, and and I want you, I want you in this for the long haul. And so, coming back, yeah, I think it was about um, reasserting the stakes, making sure that everything connected back to the original kind of essence of the story and the character, and and also, I think, just being able to tweak some stuff, move some stuff. I remember I got a a phone call as as you do on things saying well um we've lost one of our locations for that particular uh moment i think there was bad weather it was in new york i think and i had to rewrite the way that you met alan alder's character in the movie because we didn't quite have originally you were supposed to meet him i think you met him before you met you saw him in the law office and we lost a location because of bad weather or something and i had to basically rewrite how you met Alan Alder's character and and they were shooting it, you know, in a couple of days time. So you, you just get pulled into the, the, the day to day of, of production on a movie, which is on Steven's movies, you know, things run pretty smoothly because he's so organized and so sort of, um, you know, experienced, but now and again, things happen and you just have to jump in and say, okay, well, I think if I rewrite this bit and we meet him that way, then you'll never know. And we can, we can fix it. Like, so, there's a little bit of that going on as well, you know. Now, this film is obviously grounded in real world history. I would love to know just some of the historical bits you worked into the movie that make you the most excited when you watch <laughs> the finished product. Oh, man. Um, well, I do remember. Uh, I do remember thinking um, I would love to see the Berlin Wall being built on film and I think Steven Spielberg building it would be the best person for it so I remember when I first met Steven and was talking to him about it I was like you know this could be amazing right I mean obviously I guess you'd build a little bit of it and then you would you know CG the rest and all the rest of it he's like no I don't think so (laughs) and as we went through true enough you know he he built this stretch of wall and if you look at the movie everything you're seeing is built it's not mm-hmm. a CG extension. He, he built that. He wanted that feeling of, of this thing that goes on forever and for the characters in the scene to feel that sense of that line that had just been carved down the middle of, of, of this city, you know. So I think putting that on film, I also think, frankly, the U2 being shot down, it, it was, was, I mean, in, in some senses, there's a version of this movie where you don't even see that scene. You know, you hear about it, gets reported, gets, you know, you, you, someone picks up a newspaper and it's on the front page, whatever. But what I wanted to do was, was really, again, try and make an audience reconnect with 
the reality of living in that time and in that moment, which was, yeah, you know, a, a, a rocket ripped out the sky, hit this plane, this guy went down and it was terrifying. This incredibly um, sophisticated spy plane fell into enemy hands. This guy was put on trial and, and was, you know, paraded in front of the world's press, Gary Powers. And so to meet this guy in the terror of being shot down and to understand, therefore, the pressure he was under just felt like such a great way to properly honor what a weird situation he found himself in and how difficult it must have been to try and work his way through it. And so, yeah, I, I, I was very excited about about putting the U2 sequence on film. You know, that was a, that was a, that was a cool moment knowing that Stephen was going to commit to that and really wanted to shoot that, you know. Um, what I kind of want to know at, the, at this stage now, you, the film's pretty much done. We're looking at it now. This is your welcome to Hollywood party and, and what a welcome party it was. <laughs> uh, what was your favourite moment that you created seeing up on, on film? I think that's such a great question. I feel like on the bridge at the end, seeing those two men parting and experiencing a raft of emotion at the end of the movie where, you know, and Stephen's very clever with this, like how he held back and held back and held back. And then you've got these guys in a two shot together and they are maybe not going to, see each other ever again. And frankly, maybe this guy is now going to go to his death. Maybe you have handed him back to the very people that are now going to just, you know, put a bullet in the back of his head and that's it. You know, and I think seeing that on film, feeling the, the rush of relief that the exchange had happened at the same time as the trepidation of what was about to come next, having that realized in the most sort of cinematic suspenseful exuberant way by Spielberg was like wow I, that moment couldn't have been done better I, I think cinematically that was the the absolute zenith for like what I ever dreamed that moment could be and so that to me was a real we did you know when we did screenings and Stephen and I went and spoke to different you know uh, BAFTA and 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 the Academy and you know you present the movie we would often arrive right at the end of the movie, you know, just before the lights came up and you take your seats. And it was, it was frequently at that moment, you know, that we would come in. And, and so I watched that in the darkness with him so many times and asked him so many different questions about, you know, how he shot it, how he approached it, how he, you know, just kind of whispering to him and him saying, Oh, this bit here. And we, you know, we, we, we had a, had a raft and we, we took the, the camera was on the raft and then we took the anchors off the raft and we floated the raft under the bridge and then we re-anchored it and then we shot back that way. And we, you know, like just having him piece together moment by moment, how he came at that sequence. And I think that to me is the proudest moment of the entire journey, because it was, if the movie worked, it was going to work because you felt something when those two men parted company. And I, I, I feel like you do. And so that that's really gratifying, you know? A lot of the storytelling in this movie is people in rooms talking. And I think we've all, all of us here have seen movies where there's a lot of those scenes and they don't work and everything grinds <laughs> to a halt. This movie just crackles with life through all of those scenes. And I mean, I'm on the edge of my seat for a lot of these negotiation sequences. How important was your theater background, do you think, in telling those sorts of, you know, mini stories within the movie? Yeah, I think really important because I think, you know, there's nowhere to hide in theater. You don't you don't get to, to, to blow things up and you don't get to, you know, suddenly do a, do a, a crazy bit of editing or whatever to, to get the dynamism into a scene. So you live and die by what a character is saying and how they're saying it. I have to say, if you, and I know you guys do because you're, you know, scholars of film or whatever, but if you look at what he's doing with the camera in those scenes, then it, what's so brilliantly clever is the simplicity of where he's putting the camera how he's framing a glass, a hand, a reaction, you know, like he is, he's cranking up the tension in the quietest possible way. And in a way that, it, it, you know, he's taking negotiation to this almost art form where every single detail of an argument or a counter argument is punctuated by 
by a move, a look, what the camera's doing, just a gentle uh, sort of um, push in or something. So it's, it's a combination of making sure every word carries weight, every word has forward momentum for the scene. There's no sense of showboating. There's no sense of just someone speaking for, for, for argument's sake or whatever. But it's that, that the leanness and the economy of what's being said coupled to what he's doing with the camera, which is, and, and what he's doing, working with his actors, you know, which is just to make sure every single scene is an escalation. That you never start a dialogue scene on a lower rung than you ended the last one. You're, all, you're always going up the gears, always, you know. And uh, I've just directed my first movie and being on set with Stephen and uh, watching him go through that process, um, I mean, I, it's invaluable. Like I, I, the things I learned and ran home and scribbled down in a book and have used on this first movie that I directed, it's, you know, it, it's remarkable to see how pure cinema is in his, in his bloodstream, you know. And that would be the mothership, correct? That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, this film is coming out. Halle Berry is the star, I believe. That's what right. can you tell us about it? Not very much <laughs> without getting into lots of trouble. <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a movie. It's a movie for Netflix. It's a grounded sci-fi movie. And it's um, so exciting for me because I, I mean, I've done a lot of true story uh, things, you know, both for TV and film. This is a complete, um, you know, uh, fiction. This is something that I just, just snowballed from, from a, a thought I had and my imagination just kind of grew it and ran with it. And um, Hallie got involved uh, quite early actually in the development of it and, and really resonated with it. You know, I think she just sort of loved the character and loved the journey. And so writing for her, knowing what she can do, you know, she is an incredible actress, but she's also a remarkable kind of athlete. She's one of those people that you can push, you know, both, mentally in a scene but also physically through a movie like this so it so it it hopefully hits a really good pace and and she maintains this level of intensity and emotion through the movie so i'm editing it at the moment and i um i'm so excited for uh, to be able to kind of uh start that phase of my career really you know as a as a filmmaker any sense of when it will be released i uh, my understanding is the summer Okay, thing. cool. I think it feels like a summer movie. You know, it's something that we, we've, uh, I've built it deliberately for a, for a, you know, a, a family audience, really, for something that people can experience in the way that we did, which to sort of bring us full circle, the way that we watch movies when we were younger and had those experiences where you could watch it with your mum and dad. You know, it was scary, it was exciting, it was, it was funny, it was all of those things. So it, it, it to me is a, hopefully, a continuation of those kind of movies that take you somewhere extraordinary, but never lose connection with, with what's around us and the ordinary world, you know? Very cool. Cam and I met as a mutual love of science fiction. So to hear the man who did one of my favorite spy stories is now doing science fiction. <laughs> it's a, uh, it, it's a nice little bit of serendipity there. I, oh, I, 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 quite enjoy well, I, hope I, don't, I hope I don't let you down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I know your time is precious, so we have a, like a couple of quick fire questions to wrap sure. us up. Uh, mm -hmm. We have everyone who comes on is asked these questions. So, oh my goodness! Okay, we're right. a spy movie podcast. We need to know what's your favorite spy movie. My favorite spy movie is um, is uh, the spy who came in from the cold, mm. which I absolutely love and cannot stop watching. Excellent and, choice. Uh, yeah, it's it's an awesome movie, and I would anyone who doesn't know it, I would recommend like go for it it's uh, it's it's just richard burton's performance is just mind-blowing i love it we haven't officially covered it yet but it's on our list to get to and uh, i've Good heard man, i've it. seen it it's a great film but uh, yeah. i'm looking forward to tackling it officially now we're actually talking on the day that no time to die came out the james bond film the 25th um do you have a particular favorite bond film or are you partial to a particular bond yeah so i i definitely am and i love bond movies and and i um in shooting this movie i was in boston and and away from home four and a half months and away from my wife and my kids which was brutal but gave me a lot of time to watch movies or re-watch movies and i found myself going back to the connery movies over and over again and just in fact very sweetly i had my birthday while i was out there and my um few people from the crew said oh let's go to the movies you know and uh 
and um, we went along to what I just thought was going to be, you know, whatever was out that weekend. And they'd hired a, 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 a you know, a theatre and we watched Goldfinger, um, which wow. they'd lined up, which is, you know, my favourite Bond movie and, and is a perfect movie. I mean, it is absolutely every single moment and frame of that movie is just perfect. So I can't wait to see No Time, for Die, to no Time to Die, but wow, Goldfinger is going to be a tough one to beat, I think. Well, it, uh, your film is on the list with Goldfinger, so it's wow. good company there. there Guys, you go. you're making me go red. <laughs> um, I, I, and I think that pretty much wraps us up, Matt. I know your time is precious, so I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us today. We, oh, we love the film. We love Bridge of Spies. Yeah, it was a oh, fantastic you, film. And, you know, I saw it in theatres and fell in love with it. And revisiting it, it had lost none of that power. So all the props to you. Oh, thank you, guys. That's so lovely of you. It's really... It's, it's kind of thrilling to think about it and talk about it again. So thank you guys so much. And there you go, folks. That was our chat with Matt Charman. And wow, he, he really went into some depth on Bridge of Spies. Yeah, the whole genesis of this story was always fascinating to me because, you know, there's a lot of young writers out there in Hollywood looking to break through. He had worked in TV and some earlier films. But to wind up on a project directed by Spielberg, starring Tom Hanks, featuring you know co-writing from the cohen brothers like this is a real once in a lifetime opportunity but not just once in a lifetime for him once in a lifetime for any film goer really like you don't have powers like this teaming up on a project very often no it's it's very much a lightning in a bottle situation and you know sometimes you have these these perfect storms where these these forces come together and create something and sometimes it's not always good i always think of uh the dark universe You've got all these great names that come together and then you just end up with this uh, turd that is the mummy. But not only, you know, this film had a great team, it also is a great film and it made Anopolis. Yeah, and when we talked about it in the review, I uh, laid out, you know, that it was a fairly low budget movie for Spielberg. It cost, you know, $40 million. So when you have a $150 million movie, you can understand sometimes when they had this assemblage of great talent, right? Like they're all there because this is a big project. In this case, this was a labor of love for everyone involved. Like no one was showing up because it's like, well, here's a big budget payday. This is a project and a script, you know, that he'd come up with a story that he was pushing that really grabbed the attention of really great storytellers. And it was a passion project from day one. You know, it comes from his passion for, you know, real life stories you know we, we spoke about his love of the jfk film mm-hmm. and that sort of inspired him to get into you know learning about real events and that influenced his work in theater and then that went on to inspire him to come up with a story which he then pitched around hollywood and as you said you know ended up with spielberg and tom hanks in your corner and you know you just can't argue with that yeah and i give him massive props for taking something that could be very complex and conveying it in a way that a mainstream audience showing up at the theater on a Friday or Saturday night can show up for, get totally immersed in the storytelling, but still walk out actually gaining something. It mm. does not dumb its material down in any way for the audience. It still tells a very sophisticated story, but on terms that they can, you know, access. We said in the episode that we've loved the spy story, and we've learned from this interview that the spy story was was his baby, was his passion in this whole thing. And, you know, when he got this film back from the Coen brothers after they punched up some of the comedy and some of the funny elements in the film, some situational comedy, uh, he then went back and, and honed in on some of the tension on the film. So I'm glad the bit I really loved about it was him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I was really interested just to hear more about the Abel character, because when you watch Bridge of Spies, I mean... It's an incredible performance from Mark Rylands that rightfully won the Oscar. But whenever I see a character like that, I find audiences tend to give most of the credit to the actor. But like Mark Rylands was a guy who was passionate about theater. He did not do many movies. So the fact that he saw this material and was so sucked in and felt he had to do this role, there has to be amazing material on the page for him to play with. And that's why I was so interested in hearing him talk about just his theater background, because obviously there's a connection there with Mark Rylance. Like there's something in the dialogue, in the setting, in the way the character dynamics are playing out that would really pull in an actor of his caliber. And that's got to be its influence, right? His background in, in, in theater was, I assume, what allowed him to create the story that Rylance would latch onto. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I brought up in the interview about the you know people in rooms talking and like 
those scenes are genuinely dynamic to watch. And that is not the case for some of the spy movies you and I have tackled. <laughs> but that is the thing about theatre. You, you think of Hamilton, you know, mm-hmm. the, uh, the fantastic stage musical. And that is almost entirely people talking in rooms to each other. Now they're, they're rapping in rooms, but it's the same thing. I was going to say, I was a little disappointed they cut out the rap number between um, Mark Rylance and Tom Hanks. Is it, is it something about his jacket? I don't know. <laughs> You're the rap guy. You could probably come up with a nice little, nice little bar about jackets. <laughs> There's only so many things that rhyme with jacket. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing that we did learn was about the memo that he's framed in his office, which it's, it's not a big story, uh, mm. but it's something I saw. I was, I was quite touched by that. Now, we'll, we'll put a screenshot of that up during the week after this has come out, because obviously we just released the audio of these interviews. But he has saved a memo that he got from his agent that Tom Hanks is interested in the film. Right. And that, that reminded me a lot of... Uh, this is a deep cut here, guys, but anyone who's listening uh, has watched The West Wing they save a, a napkin in that that says Bartlett for America. And that's there in the background of all, like a lot of the shots in the show. And it's, it's a real like heart punching moment when you learn out what that napkin is and having that memo frame really just harkened back to that. It's just a nice touch, I think. And it seems like this is a story that, you know, as he said, no one was telling and that James Donovan's family has very much responded to. And Scott, you and I have experienced a little bit of that as well. Yeah, and I didn't really mention this to Matt on the interview, but you know, there's no there's no nation more congratulatory to themselves than the Americans. Hmm. And you would have thought they would have jumped at the chance to tell a story about, you know, I, this is a good story to tell. This is a, a, a legend in a, a American system. He is a great man. He should be celebrated, James Donovan. And so it's a surprise. It was actually found by a Brit. And, and brought to the screen in that way. But you mentioned that the family, we uh, we had a message from James Donovan's granddaughter, Beth Amorosi, and you know she's done some public speaking about her grandfather, James. And she was nothing but congratulatory about the work that uh, Matt Charman and Steven Spielberg did in you know, celebration of her grandfather's story. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when the interview ended, we also found out that... Um, the family sent him the metal lighter that Donovan had with him while he was doing the Bay of Pig negotiations, as well as embarking in the adventures we see in the film. So incredible support from that family as well. It's quite gutting, I think, about it now. Uh, we were asked a question on Twitter, but we just we genuinely ran out of time with Matt about uh, the fate of Rudolph Abel. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the listeners uh, you know, of the show reached out and said, in the end credits of the film, why does it say that he was never recognized as a spy when actually in reality, Russia released a, a bunch of stamps and he was one of them as a, as a spy, like ce- celebrated spies. So in reality, he was actually mentioned and, uh, and, and Russia did acknowledge that he was a spy eventually. But the film doesn't say that. But, uh, you know, that's a, a teeny little quibble. And I imagine it was done in after post post work in the film so it's probably nothing to do with matt anyway but sorry guys we didn't get your question yeah for sure for sure um but there you have it folks we uh, hope you enjoyed the coverage this week of bridge of spies we want to thank matt charman of course for taking the time once again to speak to us you know he's a very busy man he's got a film coming out next summer with halle berry it's his uh, sci-fi film it's his directorial debut so we wish him all the success with that i also want to thank ian from the cold war conversations podcast for joining us for the review And I hope his listeners have enjoyed this interview. But Cam, what are we doing next week? We are tackling 2001's Spy Kids. A little bit of a change of pace. But, you know, we recently did Gotcha. And we had a lot of people on Twitter asking us in advance, when are you going to do Gotcha? When are you going to do Gotcha? Well, we've had a fair amount of people contact us as well, being very interested in when we were going to tackle Spy Kids. So here we go. Let's kick it off with Spy Kids Part 1. Yeah, a different kind of tension, I think, uh, with this with this one. It's not exactly a high-stakes affair, I think, from my memory of Spy Kids. But for me, I have a lot of nostalgia for that film and a lot of love for it, so I'm really uh, fascinated to tackle it 20 years later. 
Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen it in a long time, so I'll be very curious to revisit it. Well, there you go, folks. Your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to watch Spy Kids and join us next week. Don't forget to follow us discreetly on social media at Spy Hards. That's S-P-Y-H-A-R-D-S on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. But until next week, listeners, the boss isn't always right, but he's always the boss. <laughs>